Well, good morning. Um, for those that don't know me, no, don't know me. The, um, uh, my name's Jim Knight, um, and I'm here with uh, Helen Milner, who's the chief exec of the Good Things Foundation, who I've known for uh, a very long time, uh, long enough that uh, Helen, why don't you introduce me? <laughs> yeah, so this is Jim Knight, um, Lord Jim Knight. Uh, Jim was our founding chair when we uh, set up Good Things Foundation um, back in 20, 2011. Um, we have had three names, so when I paused then it was because Jim was actually the chair of Online Centres Foundation, then the chair of Tinder Foundation, uh, and then we changed it to Good Things Foundation. Um, and uh, but Jim, I think we first met when you were a minister in the Labour government. That's right. Uh, I think probably when I was the, amongst other things at the time, the minister for uh, for digital uh, across government. Um, so uh, as well as being in the Department for Working Pensions as the employment minister. But anyway, that's ancient history. Um, so in all of that time 11 years and obviously before the online centers foundation was started you were working on this area of digital inclusion anyway how yeah it's a long time how, how's the challenge been changing in that over all that time um the biggest uh the biggest shift of course is that the people who are digitally excluded are getting further and further behind and they're much more likely to be um, uh, the, living in poverty and living with other challenges than they were. I mean, 20 years ago, um, actually, when the Online Centres Foundation was first set up by, you know, Tony Blair when he came in in 1997, um, that uh, only a third of the population had um, the internet at home. So actually, that it was very much. It was actually about a computer was a thousand pounds that most people didn't understand what the benefits were of the internet. I think now, because it's, um, you know, one in five adults, so 10 million people who are digitally excluded, that we understand that there are multiple and complex, but also um, intersectionality um, keeping people offline. So people are harder to reach People are more stubborn. They're more um, they're more resistant to getting online. The ones who who have never been online, um, but also I think we there understand. Is, there is, is it their fault? No, not at all. But but I think we also understand that there's this group that we call limited users. You know, I think yeah. ten years ago um, that people thought it was very it was you were either offline or online. It was a binary situation that you know as soon as you've got yourself a smartphone and you knew how to click on a couple of things that you were fine but now we know that actually people need to be able to use the internet and to use it in a proficient way that helps them benefit from the internet to help them with their lives and so this understanding that what we now call essential digital skills is essential um, and that there is a foundation set of skills as well as access and as well as affordability. I think our understanding of what digital exclusion means has become, uh, you know, we understand it better. I guess the experience of COVID and that reliance much more for more people on online, has that changed the understanding of inclusion further? I think it has massively changed the understanding of digital, well, digital exclusion, let's say. Um, that uh, the it's it's fascinating, Jim. You know, as you said, I've been doing this a long time, and you know, three years ago, I might mention to someone that I help, you know, that I run a charity that helps people to learn how to use the internet and help community organisations to support local people. And people's eyes would kind of glaze over and go, "Well, is that really that important? Like, why do you have a charity to do that?" And now people don't do that because the whole experience of of working from home, um, the interaction with the health service, the huge digitization of public and private services during the pandemic, that sense of being so cut off in lockdown 
and that digital really was that lifeline to, I mean, obviously I've talked about services, but other people, the rest mm -hmm. of the world, mm -hmm. and was so important that people who are frequent users of the internet can't imagine what it's like. They Or, or they now feel that they can put themselves in the shoes of people who don't or can't do that much yeah. more readily. And many of us in families have the joy of teaching the, the less digitally confident how to use things like Zoom uh, and had a lot of joy and fun yeah, <laughs> in yeah. the process. And for us um, as a charity, we also, so as, as you'll know, obviously, Jim, um, is that we have very much focused on upskilling. So the motivation mm -hmm. and the skills aspect and working with our community network, the online centres network. Um, and that during the pandemic, um, when those hyper-local places had to close their doors, the urgency and the critical nature of people not having devices and not being able to afford the internet really shot up. And, and for yeah. me, it was something that was hidden. I mean, my community partners say it wasn't hidden from them, but it was hidden from me as something that we had to do something about as a charity. And uh, we worked with um, you know, Liz Williams, who's our current chair, but also the chief exec at Future.now to create devices.now for that first lockdown yeah. period to get devices and connectivity to people who needed it. And the response to that, the huge need the, you know, within a month, we had, you know, a waiting list of, you know, 5,000 people who were significantly cut off. Um, and that we, uh, we've now embedded that into our strategy moving forward, because it yeah, has right. become so obvious that that the, the financial constraints that the people who we're helping yeah. or, and have been helping with skills means that they don't have a device of their own and they can't afford the internet. Um, I want to come back to that a bit more, but um, I, I, I want to say to anyone listening, if you've got questions that occur to you as we're going along, do post them in the Q&A. And if you want in the chat, um, uh, cause I'm keeping an eye on both and then I can ask them as we're going, um, if, if it works. Um, but uh, Helen, in all of that time, we've also had the response of governments and uh, policymakers generally. I'm a recovering politician, um, was once a government minister myself. Um, how has that shifted? And and do politicians get it? Do they do they have the right understanding of the importance of this? Particularly, I suppose when you know there were there's a whole bunch of issues at the moment kind of obviously around the cost of living and the worries around uh rising energy bills but other bills you know rising food bills we've got lots of uncertainty going on generally um it's a, it's a difficult time for the poorest people in our country it's quite a difficult time if we're fair which i'm reluctant to be um to be in government because of some of the challenges that are there um so yeah do politicians get it i think so i mean my easy answer is, is well obviously some do some don't but most of them don't right is that and you know you and i have definitely been around this block a few times is that digital is still thought of as something else right so that actually and despite covid despite that experience of the pandemic where there was an essential yeah yeah i i think it and and i really believe that it's because most decision makers do not go and speak to people who have lived experience of digital exclusion that they do not understand and they do not believe that there are 10 million people in this country who cannot and realize the benefits of using the internet. And that mm. um, it's fundamental that if it's not in front of your face, you can't see it. Um, yeah. The, and, uh, and, yeah. and do they assume that they're all old people who are yeah, absolutely. in that 11? Yeah, yeah. and the, the, I mean, one of the reasons why the issue of digital exclusion came so quickly and so rapidly up the agenda during the pandemic was because of homeschooling, actually is that because lots of people who uh, did have school-aged children 
if they were online and they had devices, they saw how much they were using that, how much that meant they were in touch with teachers and schoolwork, but also um, peers and friends. But And they realized that there were children who weren't able to do that. And, and that that was um, all over the press, all over the media as being something that needed sorting out. It was something that people understood. And then now that children are back at school, um, we're, we're seeing seeping back in this concept that it's only old people who are offline and, and who don't use the internet and who are these 10 million digitally excluded. Whereas, you know, we've got very good research, the Lloyd's Consumer Digital Index and um, Central Digital Skills Survey, we have a very good annual survey and 39% um, of people who are digitally excluded are under the age of 65. Mm -hmm. That's a huge number, that's 40% of those people. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I, do, I do lots of work in education and there are even teachers who uh, are themselves, you know, they, they struggle to be able to do the work online at home. Um, they have to be in school to do it because for, for yeah. um, you know, a variety of reasons. Yeah, I think the other thing is that the benefits are not fully understood that um yeah or, or and how I, yeah debbie's just asked a question about that yeah. saying that you know we have people coming in to use the internet for many different things but they still don't understand how important being able to use the internet is yeah that, that um a good example during the pandemic i met one young man who had applied to uh work in a famous um, online retailer's warehouse he had to apply using an online form. He then had to have an online a video, a Zoom interview. He then had to do his induction using online courses. And that yeah. um, not only did he have to have the skills to do that, but he had to have um, a device and he had to also have the data to be able to do things like Zoom interviews and, and use interactive um, online courses yeah. to do his induction. And that's to do a minimum wage job. Right. So yeah. this isn't all and, about and, unicorns and and and, no, totals, no. and 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 certainly in now I'm in the House of Lords, I speak to a number of parliamentarians who respond to that story and go, isn't it terrible that it's all online? You know, so their response is not that there's a problem that people have being able to access it. Um, it's it's just a fundamental problem that is online and why can't we have the old days? Yeah. And I think, I mean, one thing that, that so the ONS, the Office of National Statistics, um, we worked with them really closely on the online census. And so we um, had 350 places around the country where people could go to fill in their online census form and get help to do that, um, which is terrific. And I absolutely want to support that. And that, that I think that was very groundbreaking from the team um, at, at ONS. However, actually looking at investing in what we in our strategy call our sort of social infrastructure so investing in a good social infrastructure and investing in you know millions of people getting the skills that they need not just hundreds of thousands of people yeah. getting the skills that they need actually would mean that people can use you know fill in their online census form or or use yeah. online doctors practices and i think that um like this idea that you should just go back to the old days and everyone should be able to you know go there in person or, or use a telephone actually doesn't I mean I, I find it strange that people themselves can enjoy the flexibility and the convenience and the um, efficiency of yeah. doing something online but then think someone who's not online shouldn't enjoy those benefits as well um, yeah yeah now uh, I totally agree, uh, and occasionally you end up still having to phone someone, and it's it's just a horrible experience. But um, as I had to do today for my mother, um, but that uh, I won't go there. Um, let me wrap three things in together if I can, because I'm interested in in this political response, probably because I am a recovering politician. Um, I'm interested in whether governments in other places, because now good things are operating in other countries as well, whether they are responding differently. And within that, 
there's this core question that we see from both what Mark's asking around, well, surely government doesn't stand the effect on productivity if they don't get the effect on well-being. So some governments might say, yeah, this is an, I, can, I, can, I get the economic argument. Others might go, yeah, but there's a social argument. And, um, and Maxine's talked about um, it being used sort of tactically. You know, it could be included in a social care plan um, as part of, uh, of the care package. And yet there's a real avoidance of that. Um, does it, is it as simple as governments going, oh, it's a, it's a social inclusion, social welfare issue, or it's an economic investment? Um, well, obviously we have evidence of both. And at the moment, I don't think either of them are cutting through, if I'm perfectly honest. Um, yeah. With government, I mean, it would be good to talk about business because I think some yeah. businesses it, it understand it much more deeply than the than the current government does. Um, that uh, we have the economic uh, argument that um, the report we did with CBR, the Centre for Economic and Business Research, in 2018 showed that the net present value of everybody in the country having uh, basic digital skills is almost 22 billion pounds over a 10 year period. So, um, and the, the, the um, payback is almost 15 pounds for every one pound invested. So actually the, it, there's a very clear economic argument um, and that's broken down across, um, you know, employment around health, around use of public services. So in all of those indicators, all of them has a significant positive economic benefit. Um, that the, uh, if it's investment, clearly you need to have that economic argument and you need to have those uh, statistics because the treasury is always saying, we have a finite pot of money, which is going to help us better. Um, but back to your point about why don't politicians get it, that you know, we talk about cost of living and cost of living never seems to be about actually the, the looking at it in an empowerment point of view because obviously um the if you can't afford broadband and, and we we know anecdotally that quite a lot of people are now who could afford it previously are now switching off their broadband contract. yeah citizens advice have some stats around the, the numbers of you know um, just shy of two million i think who are behind yeah. their broadband payments Absolutely. But that was before this current cost of living crisis. Right. Um, yeah. So that's now um, that number will be increasing. So if actually you both help to tackle that expense and at the same time empower people to fully use, I think Debbie's point, you know, fully use the breadth of the Internet yeah. uh, to benefit lives and to be able. I mean, let's just say use public services, although that's just one tiny part of all of the benefits that they're going to get, then that investment is going to pay back in dividends and help to tackle the cost of, you know, the, that particular yeah. element of the cost of living crisis. Um, you, I think you, are, I think you kind of wrapped like three completely different things together, Jim. You asked me about international, I think, at the same time, and other. Well, uh, yeah, I'm yeah. I mean, we we work in Australia, so so we have a Australian subsidiary, and the Australian federal government have invested in a digital exclu exclusion program called. Um, be connected for older people um, yeah. and they've made significant investment obviously they've just had a change of government there so we're yeah. actually hoping that that the new Labour government will broaden that out to to other um other areas um we are also working in Romania and Poland um, and supporting there to establish yeah. um, networks but also uh, we've got um, so learn my way our online learning platform is now translated into Romanian and Poland and actually that's also particularly interesting because of the impact on both those countries with the Ukrainian refugees coming from Ukraine but mostly it's the Scandinavians who have got the real and the Baltics have got the real example good examples Estonia created um, uh, use of the internet as a human right and um, in 2000, I think Sweden um, have empowered and funded local councils as with a very real responsibility for skills, which includes digital skills. And one of yeah. those councils are working with us. So, you know, that they're, and, and we're now, we've now created a global digital um, inclusion action network. So um, quarterly, we bring together people from around the world because there isn't just one aspect of this. And it's really important that, that we're sharing and listening with others around the world and, and particularly 
you know our interest is working is seeing what other charities are doing and how are they working both with with government but also with business um that uh, it's really good to hear from the point of view of good things but it's also good to hear in terms of some of that engagement let me then go to business you know you mentioned lloyd's do this annual survey they they clearly invest in it and think it's important and good for their business ultimately otherwise they wouldn't do it um how has that changed how has the attitude of business and the desire from business to engage with this beyond a few usual suspects is is that shifting yes and i think the pandemic i think the pandemic obviously it has many, many terrible, terrible aspects, of course, deaths of, of far too many people, um, but it did raise the issue of digital inclusion. Um, one of the things that um, we work, we've worked with Virgin Media O2 is to establish a national data bank. It's like a food bank, but for mobile broadband data. Um, and now Vodafone has put data into that data bank, as has three. And now we have half a million SIMs and vouchers. So we'll be able to support half a million people with free SIMs um, uh, for, on those three networks through our online center network and through the national data bank. And that has entirely come from those businesses to say Virgin Media O2 to actually establish that. Um, yeah. Nominet has done a lot of work. We have a data poverty lab as well, um, convening and exploring issues such as should broadband be a utility that probably would take another hour if we wanted to talk about that. Um, that uh, and then um, working with a lot of, of businesses and um, that we've got, a, 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 we're um, looking for strategic partners and we definitely have quite a few businesses walking towards that as a concept of, actually looking to work with good things and to fix the digital divide and to support our new strategy. Um, so I think that almost like the, it's, it's the balance is tipped, you know, 11 years ago when we first set up, Jim, um, that it was government. It was, you know, it was mostly government who saw this as something that they needed to support. And now it is mostly- I've got a bit from, from telecoms companies and, and Maria's asking about social tariffs, which we might want to touch on, but um yeah talk talk bt there are a few who did a bit weren't there back in the day but it's uh it's great that it's now become part of the business and the the values of a bunch a much wider bunch of businesses yeah and i think that lots of businesses did extraordinary things very quickly in the pandemic to help out because we were in a national crisis and a number yeah. of them now realize that what we need is a sustainable solution and a sustainable plan to fix the digital divide and actually have moved from that emergency um, emergency plan to a more strategic sustainable plan. And that's really where the National Data Bank comes in. So, and also not thinking of it as a project, but thinking of it as a core part of the overall social infrastructure for digital inclusion, that we really need to, um, sustain on an ongoing basis as opposed to having you know a pop a project pop up here or an initiative pop up here actually having it as a fundamental bit of social infrastructure for digital inclusion one significant question to ask before we run out of time but before that very quickly are social tariffs really affordable or just a token gesture they're affordable for some um that um did you say maria asked a question is i yeah. think that they're a good thing um, but what I'm constantly saying to politicians and others is that there are probably around 2 million households for whom it's still unaffordable. Um, okay. Having cheaper tariffs for people on low incomes who can afford £15 a month is definitely a good thing. And we like good things. Yeah. Um, uh, OK, so the, the significant question probably to close with is we talked about all this change, we've talked about... Uh, politicians and their preconceptions and some of their difficulty in getting this. Um, you've recently updated the strategy of good things in order to uh, address some of all of this change and, and coming out of pandemic. Do you want to just summarise for us what the strategy looks like and in particular focus on how others can help you with the delivery of it? Um, given that this is a mission that I think we can all get behind. Absolutely. Thanks, Jim. I mean, the, um, 
that we've learned a lot during the pandemic. Um, um, I think lots of people have, but we're good things definitely have. And we have, um, as in true good things, foundation spirit come out fighting. Um, so we want to make sure that everyone has uh, internet access that they need and can afford, that everyone has somewhere local to go to get help to use the internet and everyone can feel able and safe in the online world. We have two big ambitious targets. We want to engage 1 million people. So this is up until the end of 2025. And we want to support 5,000 communities to have those digital inclusion hubs and building on and growing that online centers network across the whole of the UK. And this social infrastructure that I've talked about is how we're going to do that um, in investing in and growing, supporting and developing the national digital inclusion network as i said growing these digital inclusion hubs growing the online center network the national data bank that i've talked about and also a national device bank it's another area where there's a lot of really great work but very ad hoc and very piecemeal um, and we want to bring together that sort of drive on um, zero tech waste but also making that deliver for social good for digital inclusion so how can people help? So we uh, are growing and expanding that uh, digital inclusion network. So community organizations, libraries, local branches of national organizations, Age UK, Salvation Army, Citizens Advice can join that network. This is all free. Everything for the network and everything for beneficiaries is free. Um, we're moving from a project led um, operation model to a strategic partner led so we're definitely looking for strategic partners who want to come around this and be part of this core of strategic partners to make it happen um, and uh, we also would love people to donate devices not individuals but businesses and other organizations so to really make that national device bank sing again not a project not an initiative but a fundamental part of social infrastructure. We want to have relationships with businesses so every year they can commit to zero tech waste um, and they can donate the, their devices into that device bank. So obviously if anyone can help in any of those ways, please do. But our strategy is on our website, of course, and people can go and read it and share it, which has also been wonderful. Brilliant. Um, we're pretty much out of time. Paul wants to know whether there are any plans to make internet access free for all in a uh, where the TV might have been if we discounted the licence fee? Um, really good um, question. Uh, Nominate funds us to run a data poverty lab, and I would suggest he goes and have, have a look at that. Um, that We also work very closely with um, Labour MP Darren Jones, who chairs the all-party parliamentary group on data poverty, and it's def definitely something that we're looking at. I think that... The problem always is, why should I have cheaper free internet when actually we want the money to be going to those people who can't afford it? So is it cheaper to give everybody a little bit or is it actually better to invest in the people who are furthest away? There's a clear argument for both of those things, but we're running out of time, Jim. Um, thank you very much, Helen. It's always uh, a delight to catch up and have a chat. Um, thank you everybody for uh, coming and joining in. Um, I, I, we, we pretty much kept everyone's attention to the end, so that's uh, that's an achievement in this in this context. Um, and thanks for Digital Leaders for the week and for organising things, and um, we'll see you again soon. <laughs>